revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for a shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Would you pray with me? O Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you recognizing the pride of our hearts that often creeps in, whether we realize it or not. We so easily make life and the things we do about ourselves, about what we do, the success that we've had, the things that we've done. We give ourselves the glory. We, we put the spotlight on us rather than giving you the glory honoring you for the way in which you use us to help us, to encourage, to lead. And those of us who are followers, who are listening to the council and under the teaching and following the leaders that you've put in place, Lord, we too can have pride, thinking we know better. These people don't know who we are or know what we do. How... How can they speak into our life? We put ourselves before you and the systems and things that you set in place to help us grow as followers of Jesus. Lord, all of these things, all the pride that we bring to our life, forgive us. God, we need your mercy and grace, desperately need it. We ask in the name of Jesus that you would show that to us this morning. We pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand as we all confess our sins uh, together? We confess, Almighty God, that we have greatly sinned in our thoughts and in our words, in what we have done and in what we have failed to do. We call upon you to remember your promise to us by the blood of Christ. You are faithful and just to forgive our sins to cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
in the tyranny of self and serving ourselves, we have, uh, we're able to serve those around us. And the reason we do that is because that's what Jesus has done for us. So let's listen carefully now to our, our, Bible, our gospel reading. This is from Philippians chapter 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, of having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord Jesus didn't grasp on to his Godhead as something that couldn't possibly be lost, but instead he willingly shed all of that to become one of us and walk among us and suffer with us and suffer for us so that he might win salvation for us. And so it is my great joy as God's minister to you in Christ to assure you that if you're trusting in the finished work of Jesus, your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let's respond to that by singing together the doxology. Praise God from all blessings, Lord. Amen. Please be seated. A couple of quick announcements. First of all, Norman and Jackie are here. Don't sit down. Just stand right back up. Norman and Jackie are pregnant with Paran baby number dos. Yay! Praise God. Not wasting any time here. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. Uh, second, we're uh, Women's Collective is having an event on... Uh, February 13th, Saturday at noon, uh, in, uh, at the home of Nisa Novak, the lovely backyard of Nisa Novak. So if you have any uh, questions about that for women, ask Nisa. She's got flyers, and also look for an email on that. Uh, two, option, two opportunities we have coming up for volunteer service. The first one is um, many of you know, maybe, maybe uh, some of you know, maybe many of you know, our friend Rebecca Dyer, and she is uh, a member up at New Life, and she does a lot of work with uh, pro-life groups and sidewalk counseling outside of abortion clinics. And so we, we, help, uh, we help support her as a church, and she has been um, and is going to, there is, uh, there's an abortion, there's a Planned Parenthood like blocks away from our church. And we've always thought about how might we you know, engage in that. And so Rebecca is going out there and doing sidewalk counseling and by, for legal reasons, she needs people to go with her. So we're looking for volunteers, anybody in the church who's willing to just go with her. You don't have to say anything. You can just pray. You can stand there. She will do all the work. She's fantastic at it. You can learn from her. But we do, we're asking for people that would be willing to go out and stand there with her. Uh, so if you're interested in that, please send me an email or, or email Bailey at the office uh, and we'll hook you up with Rebecca. Second thing is, um, again, Norman Norman works for Gospel Coalition. They're having a uh, national conference coming up. When is that, Norman? April 9th. April 9th, and they need volunteers to put the national conference on. So if you are interested in that, talk to Norman. Uh, and last thing, I have to ask everybody a question. We have, um, you know, once a, once a year, at the beginning of the year, we... Uh, we do a joint service with First Pres 
uh, at the beginning of the year. And we just did that at Waterfront Park. And we always really like it, and um, we enjoy worshiping with them. And apparently they do too, because they've asked us to do another one with them on Easter Sunday. But here's the hitch. They were do, they're gonna, we're gonna do a, an Easter, they're gonna do an Easter service at the Waterfront Park again, where we were last time we met, but they're gonna do it at seven o'clock in the morning. Now, when I heard that, I was like, that's great. That's great, awesome, sunrise service. We did a midnight, you know, serve, midnight Christmas service once. I thought it was a great idea. My other, my other elders still question my judgment about that. But I, so I heard the, the sunrise service, and I was like, yes, let's do it. But other people in the church were like, no, dude, no one will show up. None of our people will get up at 7 a.m. to go to church. So I want you to, I, I refuse to believe that. <laughs> so what I need, I need is a show of hands, okay? Now be honest, okay? Even though I just kind of put everybody on the spot, right? Can you be a, be honest, who would, who would be really, really excited and interested about going to a 7 a.m. sunrise service with First Press? Who would rather just do it here? Or who would, who would like to go to the 7 a.m. service? Show of hands. Who would be really, really okay with that? No, not begrudging okay, not like shamed you into it in public okay, but like I really want to do that. That would be really cool. And who would rather just do our, our Easter service here in the courtyard? All right. Like, that's why they give you elders, right? So you just, so you don't sign up for dumb stuff. Um, anyways, okay. Uh, we are doing Sunday school again after uh, the ordination service today. It'll be a shorter one. Last week we got into the, uh, the idea of poverty and the poor will always be among you. And um, today we're going to kind of flesh out what we talked about last week and have more of a discussion about the stuff we did. So stick around after the service for that. And now we are... Uh, uh, we're honored to have our Joel Fitzpatrick who's going to be preaching the ordination service today. So may I introduce Joel? Joel Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Lord. For, thank you, Joel, for bringing the word to us. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, kingdom kids, something? I hear that yell, like, coming from this side. Yeah, I Go, get up there and... Okay, I forgot. Kenny, can I get that mic again? Sorry, man. I forgot one thing, as usual, Kingdom Kids, but we are actually, we're starting up our Kingdom Kids ministry again today in person. So rather than having the craft packages, we're actually going to be meeting together with our kids. So here is the deal for parents with children. We are going to, the, we are meeting in the outside patio right next to the chapel where we usually meet, which means if you want to, uh, if you're looking, want to go with them, you're welcome to go uh, with them to see where the kids are going, but it's out those doors and just right around the corner uh, and up up the sidewalk and in the gates to the to the room. We've got a few people going up with them, escorting the kids, escorting Anna with them. Herb is going up, and uh, some other guys are going up to escort them there. So that's where our kids will be, uh, and they'll be bring we'll bring bringing them back right before communion. So if you want to know where your kids are, you feel free to go with them and check it out. Um, if you have any questions about you know what we're doing, we're happy to answer those questions. But <clears throat> that's where they'll be. And, uh, and we're starting that up again today. Kids, five to eight. Now it's time to go in the back and uh, get with Miss Anna. Listen, what we need you to do more than anything else today is when you grab the rope to walk to the room, everybody has to hold on to that rope and don't let go, okay? That's the rule. You guys got it? Okay. There you go. Sorry, Joel. No, it's fine. Well, good morning. It's, uh, it's good to be here with you all. Um, my name is Joel. Uh, I know many of you. Um, many of you know me because I typically am uh, in and out, sitting in the back, doing doing uh, things. Um, today, I have the the great privilege of opening up God's Word with you, uh, especially on a day like this. Uh, this is a, a big privilege for me. Brian and I have been walking uh, this road towards ordination for uh, close to a year and a half now, maybe a year, something like that. And so to be able to be here today is just a huge culmination for him and his hard work. But even more than that, it's a beautiful picture of Christ's kingdom advancing um, once again. Uh, no matter how much it feels like Christ's kingdom is retreating, 
it's advancing, and Brian is going to be another signpost for that. So if you would, please take out your Bibles or take out your bulletins, and I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Uh, We don't stand out of respect for me. We stand out of respect for the speaker who is ultimately saying these words to us, which is God himself. So pay careful attention to the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read what's in the bulletin, and then um, this morning God laid another passage on my heart, so I'm going to read a little bit out of that, and then we'll we'll move uh, we'll move into the sermon from there. Uh, This is John chapter one, John chapter three, and a little bit out of Matthew uh, chapter eleven. Pay careful attention. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, "Who are you?" He confessed. And did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then are you, Elijah? (laughs) Um, He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said later on, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I've seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day, again John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. Now John chapter 3. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Now Matthew chapter 11. Um, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ... He sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, uh, we come to you now, um, and we thank you that you speak to us. So God, we wait to hear from you, and we long to hear from you. Lord God, I pray that you would be with us now, that you would open up our hearts, that we might hear your word and know what's going on, but Lord, that you would soften our hearts so that As we hear it and we assent to its truth, God, you would produce change in our lives. Lord, help us to see ourselves in John the Baptist. Grant us that. Lord, I pray for your minister that anything he says that would distract from this message, Lord, that you would just remove that. God, forgive our sins for Christ's sake, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, John the Baptist uh, was a wild man, um, literally and metaphorically. Uh, He has always been um, this figure that is interested and kind of confused me. I didn't really know what to do with John the Baptist uh, or John the Baptizer. 
Um, I mean, being a minister of the gospel is difficult enough. And yet here you have John, who is this sort of transitionary prophet. This prophet who is seeing out the old. He's kind of the last guy in a long chain of prophets. He's seeing out the old and he's bringing in the new. He's starting something new. You see, John the baptizer looms large on the landscape of ministry for me. He's like a big mountain that I'm always afraid to climb because I never know if I'm going to make it. And in many ways, um, I can understand the prophets of the Old Testament, right? They're called to prosecute a covenant. But John the baptizer stands outside the religious structure of his time. I don't know if you've ever known someone who does that. They're those kind of outlier people who just stand outside and don't really care so much about fitting in. Um, They just stand there, um, kind of like a witness to the fact that they don't fit in. Um, Fully confident in themselves fully confident in what they're doing. In many ways, this is John the baptizer. He's standing outside the religious structure of his time. He's not there to make the Pharisees happy. He's not there to make the Sadducees feel good about themselves. Um, He's there as a witness. You see, in John the Baptist, I think we see a pattern for ministry in a modern context that it's that is given itself over to the upward mobility narrative of America. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Um, the upward mobility narrative of America, we all know this, right? Um, for, my, for my parents' generation, it was like, I want my kids to have a better life than I do. So I'm going to work really, really hard, and I'm going to do all the right things, and I'm going to save money, I'm going to buy a house, and I'm going to pay off that house, I'm going to invest in my, in my 401k, and then when I die, my kids will do better than me. For my generation, it's more like, I just want nice stuff. So I'm going to work really, really hard. So I have nice stuff, a nice house, a nice wife, a nice car, a nice career. I want nice stuff. For my kids' generation, it's like, I want as many likes as I possibly can get. I want hearts all the time and followers. I've got to know. It's the upward mobility narrative that drives us over and over again, drives us to work harder, to do more, to be better. It's the never-ending treadmill that you find yourself on when you go to lay down at night at the end of the day and you're just like, really? Tomorrow? (laughs) Already? I'm exhausted. John the Baptist stands outside of that. And I think he provides us this beautiful... This beautiful picture of humility in the middle of that sort of context. And so we're going to look at this today. We're going to look at these four passages and just think about what the shape of a pastor's life should be. And in many ways, what the shape of our lives should be as Christians. So we're going to look at this in four ways. When a Presbyterian minister reads four passages and has four points... Most people get nervous. Don't worry about it. I'm going to try to get it done quick. Here we go. First one, when you're tempted to pride, confess Christ. When you're tempted to pride, confess Christ. So often uh, as a minister, I'm going to step back a little bit because I feel like I'm feeding back a ton here. Um, uh, When you're a minister of Christ, there are so many people who want to pump up your ministry. Uh, They want to call the church your church. Oh, that's Pastor Joel's church. That's Pastor Rob's church. And in many times, uh, like, you're kind of like, yeah, you're right. Like, I am pretty good at ministry. Um, Your pride takes over. You see, John the Baptist is standing out in the middle of the wilderness, 
And he's having this, uh, these people just flock to him to be baptized by him. And the religious elite, they send them out their like little, their little uh, emissaries to him to say, Who are you, John? Who are you to think you can do this? Tell us. We need an answer. You're outside of our box. We need an answer. Um, now, we know John's, uh, John's response, but we also know our own hearts, right? Um, we know uh, that when, uh, when people, uh, especially the pastors in this room, know that when people are awake and are paying attention to your sermon and they're locked in, you're like, yeah, I must be on it today. And then when somebody falls asleep and rolls out of their chair onto the ground, you're like, go home depressed, you know? Um, you see, this is totally anti-self-promotion. John the Baptist says something completely different. This is the anti-social media, right? A, a lot of pastors, they post things over and over and over again, trying to pump up their ministry to get people in, engaged, get people involved. Um, man, Satan must really not want this. Um, you're thinking you're the one who makes everything happen. People are asking you, how do you do it? How are you this good? Why aren't you in a bigger church, a bigger ministry? If only I could get time with you. Uh, a long time ago, I heard a, a minister say um, that he wanted to get put on the, on the front of his door to his office. Uh, this verse, uh, this saying by John the Baptist, uh, Behold, I'm not the Christ. Um, and the reason he wanted that is because he thought people were walking in to see him. Um, because, you know, he could make a change. He could make a difference. He could make things better. And I've always been fascinated by that. What's John's antidote? to self-promotion. Well, it's confession. It's confessing who he is in light of who God is. You see, confession isn't just us asking God for forgiveness and telling him what we've done. It is that. But confession is saying, God, this is who you are, and this is who I am in light of who you are. You see, John the Baptist realized who he was. I'm the voice crying in the wilderness. I'm preparing the way. I have my place. It's not on the cross. It's not on the empty tomb or the right hand of the Father. My place is to confess I'm not the Christ. You know, Jesus faced a similar temptation to self-promotion. Uh, it comes to us when Jesus is led into the desert by, uh, by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by Satan. And Satan, what? Yes. Is it this? Yes. Is it too far away? Yes. Yes. Sorry, brother. A great spot. Um, <laughs> Jesus is tempted to self-promote if you're the Son of God, show the world by who you are. Make a statement. Throw yourself. Angels will come. Big display. Jesus' mom tempts him in the same way at the wedding at Cana. Son, make the water into wine. Just do, what, do whatever he tells you to do. <laughs> um, right? Jesus, it's not my time yet. You see, we don't know what's going on in his heart. And while he nailed his confession, we know our hearts were a mixed bag. Our words may be the same. Brian, your words may be the same. But we think, um, we may think, I'm, I'm not Jesus, certainly, but I'm pretty darn good. Um, 
You see, Jesus was perfect for us. As I've meditated on the sign on my door, I began to realize that in my case, if I ever was to have a door to hang that sign on, the sign would be less for the people walking in, and it'd be more for me to remind me. Second thing, first, a pastor confesses Christ. Second thing, when you feel you have the power to change people, point to Christ. Uh, Jesus shows up, and John the Baptist is like, there he is. (laughs) There he is. You see, people act in so many ways as Uh, You are the one whose ministry saves them or their spouse or their children. And the scary thing is that the pastor starts to believe it. Power can be an ugly thing. Um, It makes people angry, discontent, controlling, jealous, and just miserable to be around. You see, John the Baptist had huge success in ministry. People flocking to be baptized by him for the repentance, for for the forgiveness of sins. He's doing this, and people are lining up. And yet, all his ministry was done in anticipation of the person coming after him. And he sees Jesus walk in, and it's like he bursts with relief and joy. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one I've been telling you about. This is the one who can and will and is going to change everything. The next day, the same thing happens. But there's an issue. A couple of John's disciples are like, well, if this is him, we're going to start to follow him. And Andrew and Peter leave and go with Jesus. It's fascinating to me that all the while John is pointing. He's pointing to Jesus. And even as people are leaving him and go, going to Jesus, you don't see bitterness in him. You don't see anger in him. Because he knows his place. His place is as a person who points. A person who shows the way. We're to shape our work in such a way that we're a signpost. We point the way, the way to wholeness, the way to life, the way to joy, the way to forgiveness. You see, we're not the thing ourselves. We're the sign that points to the thing. Here's an example. I always think of pastoral ministry in two ways. One is a signpost and the second is a window. Uh, Kids, I don't know about you, but uh, when Disneyland was open, I was pretty pumped uh, about Star Wars land, about Galaxy's Edge. I was super pumped about it. Maybe adults, you're that way too. Um, And I can remember us going, and all the way we were seeing signs. And pretty soon the signs changed from like, you know, normal Disneyland signs to like Star Wars signs. And we saw the sign for the Millennium Falcon. Now it would be utterly ridiculous for me to stop right there and say, behold, the Millennium Falcon. This is the ship be ridiculous. Everybody be like, what are, you, what are you talking about? No, the sign pointed to something much greater than it. Much more beautiful than it. Much more fun than it. And honestly, I mean, it was fantastic. I got to sip blue milk, which is amazing. But I wasn't there to see the sign. I was there to ride the Millennium Falcon. I love photography. I love taking pictures of buildings. In fact, this building is beautiful, right? Um, The architecture, many of the windows, I love it. 
And there are a lot of ugly windows in this world. Um, we've got a, a particularly ugly set of them on my house. Um, but what's the deal with a window? Well, it, a window, especially a beautifully shaped window, wants to make you look through it to see what's beyond it. You see, a pastor is not just a signpost pointing the way, behold the Lamb of God, but he's a window where people can look through him and in his own broken way, they can see Christ. You see, when we think we have the right mix of good advice, we, mix our, we miss our calling. Um, John the Baptist knew this. He knew it. He knew he was a voice crying, pointing, being looked through so that people would see the one who is so much better. Jesus, the Lamb of God. He's the one with the power to change people through the work of the Holy Spirit. He's the one to bring about His kingdom. You and I are willing participants in that as we work with Him. And yet it's our job to show people the way to Christ. Third point. When people measure you against other pastors, the pastor fades away so Christ can get all the glory. This is the, a perennial problem in the church. I mean, honestly, um, you don't have to read very far into the New Testament uh, to hear the Corinthian church saying, I'm with Paul, I'm with Apollos, and then the super spiritual people are like, yeah, I'm with Jesus. Like they fold Jesus juke everyone else. We see this all the time. When a church plant moves into the same neighborhood as another, there's friction. What are you doing here? Why are you doing this? Why here? Why now? You see, people are into measurements, into success, into nickels and noses. How much did we get in the tithe offering this week? How many people showed up? They're into percentages. How many people go to this ministry or that? And all the while, they miss the people. So often, we elect elders who are better businessmen than they are shepherds. You see this, you don't have to look very much further than the rise of like the American celebrity pastor to see this reality. When measurement becomes the point, pastors turn from kind shepherds to cruel taskmasters, always wanting more and more, all measurements, all comparisons. Uh, I can remember in my pastoral ministry seminar class, we had a discussion about what makes a church successful. And the question was, is it, uh, is it uh, fruitfulness or is it faithfulness? Is it how many people show up or how good you are at holding to the truth? Which is it? And people are like, who's right? <laughs> we see this exactly with John. People show up and they're like, who are you? Aren't, you? aren't you worried? Jesus is baptizing over here. He's getting more people than you. Doesn't that bother you? Aren't you concerned with the status of your ministry? John answers them in this beautiful way. He must increase and I must decrease. Eugene Peterson, in his translation, uh, <clears throat> the message says this, this is the assigned moment for him to move into the center while I slip off to the sideline. What a great, what a great message. 
You see, this is what we're taught to pray for when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Notice it's thy, not my, right? Um, It's Jesus, your kingdom come, your will be done. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You see, in this prayer and in this John the Baptist way of ministry, we're putting Jesus in His proper place. And we're taking our proper place. Another man, another person, another Christian in line with all of the ones who have come before us. Why? Because when Christ is glorified, we enjoy our work. (laughs) We do what we love to do. And we're frankly enjoyable to be around. A pastor like John the Baptist is called to preach the gospel, to die, and to be forgotten. Last point, last vignette. When you doubt your confession, (coughs) you doubt your pointing, you doubt your fading, you doubt whether it's all worth it, Jesus gently restores. John the Baptist in our last passage in Matthew is in prison. Uh, He knows what's coming. Um, He's facing a point in his life when he understands that he's about to die. And he's like, okay, Jesus, like, are you actually the one? Seems like a reasonable question to ask, right? Um, Jesus, I'm about to die. Are you actually the one? Are you the Messiah? I want to know if it's all worth it. Because if it's not, I'm bailing out of this thing so I don't die. As a minister and as a Christian, there are so many times when you're forced to ask the question, is it all worth it? Things go bad. People are hurtful. Things don't line up the way you hoped they would. Your life doesn't work that uh, out the way that you hoped it would. And you ask the question, is it all worth it? Jesus is most likely sitting with a crowd. Getting ready to teach them. And John the Baptist, uh, his disciples show up. And they're like, Jesus, we got to know. Like, are you the one? John sent us. And notice what Jesus does. Jesus responds so gently to that. He responds in such kindness to John the Baptist's doubt. He says, without pride, so gently, without being power hungry, so lovingly, not seeking to to compare himself, he reminds John of the prophecy. He reminds them. Among, and, then, and then the most beautiful thing happens. Jesus, in the midst of his sermon, this great sermon, Jesus says, amongst women, there's no one who's been born who's greater than John the Baptist. Here's this person struggling with doubt. Jesus, are you really the one? And Jesus puts him up, builds him up, He tells them, go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. Deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. You see, in all of Christian, in all of your failure, in all of your doubt, in all of your burnout, in your questioning whether it's worth it or not, Jesus forgives. Jesus restores. Jesus gently reminds you. 
And then Jesus is pleased to use you to build his kingdom. In a world that wants more, bigger, faster, more compelling, Jesus must be the centerpiece of our ministries. When we fail and we make ministry about us, the beautiful thing is we take our place in a long line of ministers who've done that. But the beautiful thing is God still calls us as broken vessels to pour out His grace into other broken vessels. He loves us and He forgives us. So Brian and the people of Resurrection Presbyterian, may God make you and all of us here people who confess Christ who point to Christ and then move out of the way so that Christ can gain all the glory in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we look to you, uh, the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. And we're so grateful, God. Um, We're thankful that you You have saved us, you have commissioned us, you have moved us so that we might become uh, pieces, parts of your kingdom for your glory. Lord, we pray that you would uh, bless the remainder of this service. And God, we pray that you would give Brian fruitful ministry as he confesses and points and moves out of the way. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So now I get to stay up here um, and continue. Uh, uh, We're going to move into the time in our service where we actually carry out the actions of the presbytery. Um, This is the point where we actually ordain uh, Brian. Brian is not ordained yet. Um, We're doing that now. And you guys all, whether you know it or not, you've been in a presbytery meeting. Um, This entire time, we started it before church, we'll finish it after. Welcome to South Coast Presbytery. Um, It's good to have you with us. Uh, The Presbytery works through commissions. Um, Commissions are groups of, of presbyters, groups of pastors, ruling elders, and teaching elders who are sent to carry out things like this on behalf of the church. And so the commission is actually acting on behalf of the Presbytery. So when you see us lay hands on Brian in a socially distant sort of way, um, that is the presbytery doing that. Um, So welcome. Uh, If I could have the members of the commission for the presbytery stand. Um, We have have, uh, five members. I'm one of them. Uh, Joel Fitzpatrick. We have Rob Novak. Please stand, Rob. Thank you. Uh, Charles Davis. Where's Charlie? over here. Um, we have Herb Smith, which we all know and love, who we all know and love. And then we have John Efantides in the back. Uh, John uh, is a ruling elder from New Life Presbyterian. You guys can sit down now. Um, we're really grateful for this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to run through sort of a, profesh- or a procession of things. Uh, first of all, Pastor Rob is going to up, get up and he's going to give a charge. We're Presbyterians. Welcome to the sermon parade. He's going to give a charge to Brian and then ask Brian questions. And then Chuck's going to get up and hopefully give a shorter sermon to the congregation. A charge to you all and then ask questions. And then we're going to lay hands on, on Brian and we're going to pray, commissioning him for work. And then you get to see me again, and then we pray again, and then we're done. So Brian, I'm going to ask you to come up and stand in front of the pulpit. And Rob, I'm going to invite you up to uh, to give Brian his charge.
this passage specifically for your ordination service. So, so here we go. This is perfectly suited to you and a charge to you. So Simon Peter, this is from John uh, chapter 21. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. No, just, just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, they said to him, we will go with you. All the disciples were with Peter, right? And they said, we'll all come with you. And so they got in the boat that night, and they caught absolutely nothing. And Jesus, just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, and yet the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you any fish? And they said, no. And so he said, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And so they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. And so that disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. And when he got out on land, he saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. And he said, uh, and he said for the second time, Jonah, son, uh, Simon, son of, of John, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Amen. So the Bible tells us that uh, the humbled will be exalted. And if you're ever in need of a dose of humility, go fishing with Brian White. Because you'll be in the back fumbling with trying to get the fish on the hook while Brian will be like jack poling yellowfin after yellowfin onto the deck of the boat, making you feel like a complete and utter amateur and failure at life. But then at the end of the day, he'll give you half of the fish he caught, so he makes up for it, right? So, <laughs> so that's a good thing. And I've always been impressed by the fact that I, I feel like God trains us for ministry. Those who has, who has a call on people's lives for ministry, he trains us for that ministry long before we even know what's going on. For David, as a matter of fact, David was a shepherd fighting lions and bears in the fields before he ever faced Goliath, so that when he got to Goliath, he was like, that's not a lion, that's not a bear, I can take this guy out. I feel my own life as a musician and as an artist and as an entrepreneur and creating music businesses, all of that was God training me to become a minister and to be a church planner later in life. I had no idea what was going on, and I think God is giving you the gift of fishing, Brian, so that as a part of training you to be a fisher of men. And so there are three things, of course, in this passage I want to quickly point out. Three things that Jesus is teaching to Peter right here that also go for us. This is an important moment in the history of the New Testament, right? As Joel just pointed out, John the Baptist was the last of the great Old Testament prophets. There was a time when God accelerated and flourish his ministry, and then he had a time where he faded out, that Jesus was on the scene doing what Jesus and only Jesus could come to do, and now is the point in history where Jesus is handing off that ministry to his apostles, who are the elders of the church, to then hand off to other men. And so in this, Jesus is speaking to Peter, but he's also talking to you. So first thing is this, without Jesus, you can't catch anything, but with him, you can fill the boat. You and I both know more than most men through our, our, our extensive experience and experiment in life <laughs> that uh, we can do absolutely nothing without Jesus. And without Jesus, we can end up in some very scary, dark places. Amen. Uh, but even in ministry, we can transfer that into ministry. Uh, as Joel so eloquently said, we can try too hard to do things on our own strength from our own bad motives of self-glory. It is totally possible to slave away at ministry for years, serving yourself and not even know it, and come up short and burn out and not, um, not fulfill the call that God has on your life whatsoever. 
when we do things when we are slaves for the wrong motives and the wrong reasons. But the opposite is also true. When we are slaves for Jesus, and make no mistake, we, our, our versions like to clean that word up and call it bondservant, but the meaning is slave. You have been rescued, liberated from the slavery of sin and death, and you are now a slave of the Lord Jesus to do his bidding, come what may. And when we tirelessly work in his strength from the motives of his heart, to see his people brought up, to see his people flourishing, to see his people healed and strengthened, and to see his gospel go out and his kingdom, not ours, expand, uh, we should and could and should expect him to work through us to fill the boat. And so always check yourself, but don't ever let go of that expectation that Jesus can and will do something amazing through your ministry. Second thing, when you know it's Jesus, throw yourself into the sea. <laughs> As a pastor I follow, he talks about how when he's 51% sure that Jesus is calling him to do this, he, he goes all in, he acts. He calls it the 51% decision, uh, which is, you know, I, I, don't wanna, I wouldn't want to put a number on that, you know, exactly, uh, or try to put a percentage point on it, but the point he's trying to make is that when you become sure in your heart that this is Jesus calling you to do it, not your own motives, not the world, um, he acts on it. He goes all in. And um, there's going to be times in ministry, many, many times, when you're sure it's Jesus, uh, but no one else is. <laughs> and all people, well-meaning people, are going to come to you with, and, and give you every convenient cultural sensibility to hide behind as to why you should not do what God is calling you to do. It's too hard. It's impossible. It's inconvenient. It'll cost too much. It'll cost you too much. It'll be emotionally draining. No one would ever do that. Other churches don't do that. Why should we? But if you're sure you're Je it's Jesus, if you know it's Jesus, do it. Do it. And even if you're wrong, and it's not, He'll take that faith and, create and, and teach you something beautiful and amazing in and through it. Last thing, love Jesus more than anything else so that you can feed his sheep. How are you going to find strength to do that? How are you going to be encouraged to do all that? Um, and the answer is you have to love Jesus more than all of these, more than anyone else or anything else, which is so counterintuitive for us, for our culture. I mean, how, what does that mean? I'm supposed to love Jesus more than my wife, more than my kids? And the short answer is yes, because the only way you will ever be able to truly love your wife and love your kids is if you love Jesus first and you put him first. Uh, you love him for who he is. He's the creator of all things. He's given you life and breath and everything else. And you love him for what he's done for you. He has liberated you from sin and death and given you an inheritance and a new kingdom in a whole new world. This broken and, 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 and black and ash-stained world that we live in, that we try to dress up and make pretty and convince ourselves is so great, is a fallen and corrupt and cursed land. And he has been given you an inheritance in a new kingdom of beauty and light that is more indescribably wonderful than even our imagination can tell us. And he has called you to this ministry to sacrifice yourself and everything about you in order to bring his people in and to keep them in and to care for them and to patch them up and to bandage their wounds even when it costs you greatly to do so. And so if you love Jesus for what he's done for you, he will create, he will give you the spiritual strength and margin in your life to overflow into the care and love of his people. And so feed his sheep. Feed his sheep with word, water, bread, with wine, with your experiences, with your knowledge, with your wisdom, with the spirit, and with an overflowing love that you have for Jesus that flows out of you and into this congregation. Amen. And that's it. See, that, was, that wasn't too bad, was it? Ryan, <clears throat> there's questions now, uh, vows that you are to make. Are you ready? Sure? No turning back. Okay. Do you believe that the scriptures of the Old and New Testament is originally given to be the inerrant word of God 
and the only infallible rule of faith and practice? And do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith in the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? And do you further promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of this system of doctrine, that you will on your own initiative make known to your presbytery the change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of this ordination vow? And do you approve the form of government and the discipline of the Presbyterian Church in America in conformity with the general principles of biblical polity? You promised subjection to your brethren in the Lord. You know what that means? Okay. We'll, we'll fill you in later. Don't worry about that one. <laughs> Have you been induced, as far as you know, uh, as, have you been induced, as far as you know, your own heart to seek the office of the holy ministry from love to God and a sincere desire to promote his glory in the gospel of his son? And do you promise to be zealous and faithful in maintaining the truths of the gospel and the purity and peace and unity of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may arise unto you on that account? And do you engage to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties as a Christian and as a minister of the gospel, whether personal or relational, private or public, and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your manner of life and to walk with exemplary piety before the flock of which God shall make you overseer? And are you now willing to take charge of this church, agreeable to your declaration when accepting their call? And do you, relying upon God for strength, promise to discharge it to it the duties of a pastor? Chuck? Sorry. All right. Well, as you all heard, a charge to Brian as he's being called as a minister of the gospel. So to the... There's a responsibility for you, those of you who are members of this church who have called Brian, like we did just a week ago. You guys voted to, to bring him in as a, as a minister. So now there's a responsibility for you. God calls you uh, to respond and to obey and, and, and follow Brian's lead. And this uh, call is taken or charge is taken from Hebrews chapter 13, uh, beginning at verse 17. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls, as those, who are, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. Real quick, there's just a few words I want to cover in this text here. The, the words obey and submit, we'll cover those in as one, and then pray. So first, obey and submit. So probably the two biggest buzzwords of our 2021 years, especially the second, you know. In a world where we're, we feel like we can take charge of our own life, no one can tell us what to do as long as it makes us feel happy and satisfied and fulfilled. You know, I'm the writer of my own story. You can't tell me otherwise. So this call and charge can be really offensive, you know. I can't, I'm not subject to anyone, but God has thought it good to put us under that, to put us under teaching and authority of others. And here, God is putting you under the teaching and the care of Brian. Brian's being charged by the Lord to care for your souls. That's what the author says here. And we were literally just talking about this with uh, uh, someone we were interviewing for membership, this very passage. When all is said and done and Brian is standing before Jesus, Jesus is going to ask him, how did you care for the souls I put under your charge? You know, imagine getting that question in a quarterly review from your boss. You know, everything looks good, but by the way, how did you care for the souls that I put under your charge? That's a question that's going to come to him. So what does that mean for you? If you're thinking this is a big ask, what does that, what does that mean to obey and to submit? Well, just a few things. Really, it means you're going to give Brian the, the freedom to, and, and to listen and to hear and to follow his teaching. 
That means when he preaches to you, preaches God's word, reminding of you of his grace, calling you to repentance, calling you to follow after the Lord, that you are going to take that and allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart in that. That also means when Brian is counseling you, that he's using the wisdom that God has given him, the experience God has given him to help you grow as a follower of Jesus, that you're going to listen. You're going to take time to process and to wrestle with what Brian is telling you and the wisdom that Brian is giving you. Now, all, I know we all love Brian and care for him, and many of you have been under his counsel already, but there's going to be times where our sin and our insecurity and our baggage is going to speak louder than what Brian is telling you to do. That's just going to happen because we're sinners. We wrestle and we struggle. So what you're called to do is not give subject and precedence over those voices because what God is going to do through Brian is going to help transform you into the image of Jesus. But that means you're going to take that time and hear and listen and allow the Lord to use him in making you into a follower of Jesus. But that also means not just being obedient, not just listening, but you're also called to affirm him to encourage him. You're going to hear this question in just a moment. Are you, are you willing to encourage to help Brian in his calling as a minister? You know, there's all kinds of expectations and real responsibilities that a minister has. You know, caring for your souls, that's a real weighty responsibility. There's also expectations that, are, that can be unrealistic. You know, Rob and I were at a conference just a few years ago uh, it was one put on by the, the PCA, it's Beautiful Orthodoxy Conference, and we were listening to a talk given by Pastor Scott Sauls, who's a pastor of a Nashville uh, PCA church, and he gave this statistic, this uh, survey that was done by Lifeway, which is a Christian publishing company. And they went around to different members all across the board, thousands of people, asking them how many hours you think a pastor should serve and, and do the various tasks he's been called to do, preaching, teaching, counseling, administrative tasks, all those things. Log all the hours. How many, think, how many hours do you think you should spend on these things? So they gathered all the data, and you know what they found? The, the, the expectation people had on, on pastors, what they thought pastors should do, the average amount of hours he should serve is 114 hours a week. So he has to have the equivalent of two to three full-time jobs, also care for his family, and do normal things like sleep and buy groceries. You know, and that's the expectation that we can often have on our ministers. We think, oh, he has all this time in the world to do the things God has called him to do. And when we think about that, we can, we can misunderstand him and put false ex expectations rather than encouraging him, building him up, affirming him in this high calling that God has given him. So do that. Take time to affirm him. Take time to encourage him. Remind them of, of the ways in which God has used him in your life. Give examples. Tell them, Brian, what you said this week to me, what you said in this sermon, this is how the Lord's used that in my life. These are the things that God has done in and through you in my life, in my family's life. Brian is going to need that encouragement from you. And that's what you'll be called to do in affirming and encouraging him in his walk as a minister. That doesn't mean Brian is right in everything he says. You know, we've been talking about he's accountable first to the Lord and then also to the men who are in his session and to the presbytery. We believe in a plurality of leadership. This isn't just a solo job. And that doesn't mean you can't come to Brian and say, Brian, help me understand something you said. Rub me the wrong way. Help me to, to grow and to, to, to follow your lead. I just don't understand or I'm hurt by something that you said. You have the opportunity and the ability to do that because Brian's a sinner. Brian's weak. Brian's not going to do all of this perfectly. And with that comes the calling from you to be gracious. Be gracious to Brian as he grows in this. As Brian is gracious to you and as the Lord has been gracious to you, we tell members this all the time, that as we're leading and guiding and helping you grow in your faith, we're asking you also give us the space and the grace as we help you do that, because we're sinners, and Brian's a sinner as well. But with that, 
when it comes to obeying and submitting, what the author of Hebrews also calls you to do is to pray. To pray for Brian. To pray for this high calling that God is giving him. Because Satan is going to stop at nothing to try to bring him down. To try to get in between his marriage. Trying to get between the relationship with his kids. And the relationships with the men of his session. And the relationship with the people he's trying to care for. Brian's bringing his, his sin and his baggage into ministry. Satan's going to try to to get into that, to dig his heels and his claws into Brian. So you are called to pray for him, to lift him before the Lord, to ask God to continue to show his grace and mercy to him, to remind him of that. Because we as ministers need God's grace just as much as you do. And sometimes it's easy to forget that. Sometimes it's easy to get so bogged down by just the weight of ministry. We become discouraged, anxious, afraid, feeling abandoned, feeling misunderstood. Brian's going to need your prayers. The Holy Spirit would, would continue to remind Brian that he hasn't left, that he's still going to use him. That even in all his weaknesses and, and past, God is still going to work in him. But you come in. And support him in that. Bring him before the Lord in prayer. Well, with that, as you just heard a, a call and a charge to Brian and questions, you too are going to be asked these questions. If you agree to bring Brian in as a pastor, would you please answer these questions in the affirmative? First is, do you... The people of this congregation continue to profess readiness to receive Brian White, whom you have called to be your pastor. Do you promise to receive the word of truth from his mouth with meekness and love and to submit to him in the due exercise of discipline? Do you promise to encourage him in his labors and to assist his endeavors for your instruction and spiritual edification? Do you engage to continue to him while he is your pastor, that competent worldly maintenance which you have promised, and to furnish him with whatever you may see needful for the honor of religion and for his comfort among you? Amen. Well, having accepted that charge, I'd like to ask all the elders, if you are an elder in this room, you please come up as we're going to lay hands and pray for Brian as Herb is going to lead us in prayer. If you're an elder of any of our Nate Park churches, you're welcome to come up and lay hands on Brian. Kneel down, buddy. Kneel down. Yeah. <laughs> well, please join. I'll join with this, with us in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a glorious day for your church and for this church, each of us here and for Brian and his family. What a portrait of your loving kindness and gracious sufficiency in the calling that you give us. You take each of us from the weak and worthless thing that we are and bring us into the nourishing nature of your spirit where we stand and are transformed and made new and patiently and painstakingly grow and discipline us into a servant useful to the master and the furtherance of his kingdom. O oh Lord, why did you choose us? What drew you to our writhing naked form cast aside in a field without hope or care, covered with the blood of our depraved and fallen birth? But we were washed and we were sanctified and we were made justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Who were we for you to see us thrown out into the open field, squirming and abhorrent in our guilty blood? But you saw us and said to us, live. You raised us up and covered our spiritual nakedness and made us your own. You bathed us with water, washed us clean, and anointed us with the oil of gladness, purpose, dignity, and worth. And you clothed us 
and embroidered us with cloth, put sandals on our feet, adorned us with spiritual ornaments, and placed a beautiful crown upon our head. We then ate fine flour, honey, and oil, and became exceedingly beautiful and advanced into royalty. And you established your everlasting covenant with us and gave us the inheritance of your good future and hope. So now, as we continue to grow together in your everlasting kingdom, reflecting what it means to live out what is true and good and beautiful, you give us gifts to further our faith and fellowship, and by your Spirit we thus sanctify this today. Lord, as Brian is now set aside for a lifetime of ministry, a gift to your church, and now as an under-shepherd for this congregation, fill him, Lord, with your spirit of wisdom and love, understanding and truth and faith and trust that what you have called him to do, you will also bring it to pass. Equip him now with every good thing to fulfill your calling upon him and enlarge your spirit in him to be steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Let him throw himself into the sea of your calling, that he may truly become now a fisher of men and add an abundance of souls to the glory of your kingdom. May this day mark the fulfillment of your promise to make him a servant leader of people, of your people, to feed your sheep from the wellspring of your mighty spirit within him. Build him up with your spiritual armor and infuse him with the zeal of a resolute warrior. And when the battle rages from all sides and his endurance lags, refresh him anew with honey from the rock. When his heart breaks with the pain of striving in a very broken world, remind him that your purposes cannot be thwarted and that in working all things together for your sovereign good, you make streams in the desert and mountains into a highway, bringing back the years the locusts take away. And when he stumbles or falls prey to the enemy within and the accuser without, remind him that unto you alone he stands or falls, and that stand he will, for you are able to make him stand. And in that standing, even unto the end, may he be with the word of your grace and truth as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star of his heart arises to bring him home, even unto the day of eternity. May he then open his eyes and with his faith, now his sight and his ears, having heard your long expected call, then hear your precious welcome home. Well done, good and faithful servant, rejoicing then forever there in the power and love of your most sacred name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, uh, friends, let me encourage you not just to be praying for Brian, um, but be praying for his wife, Janie, and his children. Um, while Brian gets to stand here and kneel and, and get all the hands laid on him and everything, um, Janie and the children um, are also being called into this life of ministry along with him. So Janie, know that our prayers are with you and our hearts are with you and our love is for you. Uh, brother, now we've come to the point in our service where we give you the right hand of fellowship um, to take part in ministry with us. So welcome, brother. Yep. Uh, I now pronounce and declare that Brian White has been regularly elected, ordained, and installed a pastor of this congregation, agreeable to the Word of God and according to the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church in America and that as such he is entitled to all support, encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. 
Rob, you will now, uh, oh no, we need to close in prayer. John, would you close us in prayer? Let's unite our hearts once again. My blood is true drink. Amen. Amen. We do, we do uh, Lord's Supper every week here. I know we just had a long service and an ordination service on top of that. But the Lord's Supper is, where, is, the, is a part of the service where God is, is, is in, a, in a special way. We don't completely understand. He's making real to us everything that was just said to us in the gospel. So that when we come to the Lord's table, 
we're, you know, we call it communion. And that's because Jesus is communing with us in a special way that is strengthening us and helping us to make it through, through the week as lights in the world and as, and, as, and as ambassadors for the gospel, which is what we all are. So we do this every week. The Lord's body was broken for us. His blood was shed so that our sins would be forgiven. It assures us that we are a part of his kingdom now. Uh, and that gives us hope. So this is a meal for uh, any, anyone who's a Christian. If you're visiting from another church today uh, and you remember that church and you've been baptized and that church rightly preaches the gospel, come take this meal with us, please. If you're struggling this week, please take this meal with us. It's to strengthen us in our walk. So if you're struggling but you're repentant, come and take this meal. Uh, if you're not a Christian, if you're here visiting us today, first of all, we're super glad that you're here today. Welcome. We're super glad you're here. Um, but we ask that you not partake of this part of the service. This is for just for Christians. Um, but you can take this time to pray if you'd be so inclined and to ask God whether what you've heard here today about Jesus and about his complete, uh, uh, the fin his finished work, which completely saves us, about his, um, the salvation that he's won on our behalf. Or you, uh, please feel free to do that, to pray. And if you have any questions about that, we'd love to talk to you after the service. So let's now lift up our hearts and pray uh, to God as we approach the Lord's table. God, you are a, a great and merciful God. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for calling Brian into ministry uh, to serve you and to serve his people. Uh, Lord, and we know that you first served us, that you first loved us, that you gave yourself on the cross for us so that we might be free from sin and from death uh, and so that we might even enjoy the beauty of eternal quality life. And even that starts now, Lord, as we commune with you and as you strengthen us. And so, Father, we pray, uh, we pray that you would comfort us through this meal, that you would set apart by the power of your Spirit these elements of bread and wine so that we might receive by faith the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Now let's all come up and take uh, some bread and wine each and then go back to your seats and we'll all eat and drink together. We've got grape juice. Grape juice is in the outer rings uh, if you have any health concerns. And now would you come and taste and see that the Lord is good. When I in awesome wonder
Brothers and sisters, the bread that we break is our participation in the body of Christ. Take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus was broken for us for the complete remission of our sins. This is the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is our participation in the blood of Christ. Take, drink, remember, and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus was shed for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, for the complete remission of our sins. This is the blood of Christ. Now let's pray. Well, merciful God and Father, we ask that through the operation of your Holy Spirit and the remembrance of our Lord Jesus and the proclamation of his death that you may strengthen and establish us in true faith and in blessed fellowship with Christ, in whose name we all pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Would you please stand for our last song of rejoicing.
tradition that the uh, newly installed minister has the privilege of giving the benediction. And if you're unfamiliar with that, this is not a prayer. This is God's blessing to you. He gives the first word and he gives us the last word. And so as you go out throughout your week, remember that you're going into the world with the blessing of the Almighty upon you. So lift your hands, raise your head up, and receive God's good blessing to you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show his favor and give you his peace. Amen.